I know of no better way in the world to, to control your future than to be an entrepreneur. There's, there's no lifestyle like it that I'm aware of. I have a good uh, uh, friend that often comments that uh, there, there's really no better preparation for what we believe in our religion and advancing and learning and growing than being an entrepreneur. So the highs are really high and sometimes the lows are really low. I appreciated the introduction uh, here, but I, there's one fact that was missed, and it's the fact that I've had a lot of failures. Uh, I'm known in the U.S. now as the bootstrap entrepreneur. I've founded or co-founded 36 companies. Of those, 16 have become multi-million dollar businesses. Uh, each started with five to $10,000, but it's not the fact that's really important to me. The fact that's really important to me is along the way, I've also had 14 really good failures. And so I'm a strong believer that failing, but failing efficiently is really important. So uh, today in my lecture, I'm gonna, uh, I think I'm gonna talk about a number of things. I'm gonna look for your eyeballs to react and it'll be fun to see where this goes because normally I'm forced to lecture on zigzag principle and today I'm not gonna. So I think we'll cover a little bit of philosophy. We'll co maybe a co uh, talk a couple of the models that I've been developing and hopefully give you a couple of little practical feedback items that will really practically help you. I'm gonna do a little impromptu call here, uh, if you bear with me for one second, to drive this first point home. This wasn't scripted, but I'm gonna do it anyways. All right, I've got a $100 bill right here. Does anybody want the $100 bill? Thank you for not saying, no, 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 you can't do that. There's a <laughs> I did that one time back east. I think I was lecturing at MIT, and there had been some terrible, awful guy that wrote a book, and he had taught all the students that what you do is just got to race up and grab the $100 bill. And so when I did that one time, someone ran up and grabbed it, and I didn't know what to say. It was like, that's theft. That's not. <laughs> Thank you for being so exuberant. Okay, so it's worth $100. It's all crumpled. Does anybody want the $100 bill? <laughs> really, why? It's crumpled. Stupid, stupid, dumb. Duh. I even kicked it. You can put it up on the stage there, that's all right. <laughs> Does anybody want the $100 bill? Why? It's still worth a hundred dollar bill, but I called it stupid. I stomped on it, it's all dirty. Why would you still want that hundred dollar bill? Because it's still worth a hundred dollar bill. As a matter of fact, I would contend and argue that most of the value comes in failures. Uh, you learn more, you get more education when you fail, and when people call you stupid and you're down, than you do when you're standing on top of the pyramid in the victory pose. Uh, I spent the first half of my career, this, this isn't communicated much now, but I spent the first half of my career in the corporate world. I had a really great run in the corporate world. I ran Mitsubishi Electric's PC division here in the US. I ran about.com before we sold the New York Times. And I was like on top of my game, I thought I was all that. And finally I decided I want to be an entrepreneur, so I quit. And, uh, started my venture. I paid my home off and had enough to last a year. Uh, the first thing I did is, is I blew my Achilles tendon out. It was flat in bed and trying to do work from bed. My first one, miss, two, miss, three, miss. Now it's getting uncomfortable. Three strikes, you're out, right? Now it's really un uncomfortable. It took me until my seventh attempt to actually have a success. And so I'm really here to communicate to you, and really I think the first thing I want to communicate to you is, is, is it's okay to fail. But the trick is, is to fail efficiently. If you're gonna fail, make sure that you fail efficiently and get it out and get it over your system. And I think that's one of the fundamental areas that I teach and philosophy differs a little bit. I get really concerned. I, I was doing a lecture here one time at a big entrepreneur conference and I was following, it was over in the Jer Joseph uh, Fine Arts Center and I was following a couple of young men into the room and they were saying, oh yeah, let's do it, let's do it, man, let's do it. Let's take our credit cards. Between the two of us, we can crank up to like $21,500. Let's do it all. You all in? Let's go to Vegas. Put it on black and roll the wheel. 
That's, I, I think that's really a foolish, foolish way to do it. I'm a firm, firm believer in being a bootstrap entrepreneur in many and most of instances. Now there's a lot of times that it is appropriate to take capital. But most people think that the problem of all life is solved as soon as they have a million dollars in the bank. And I'm here to tell you that that's the start of the pain. Has anyone taken a million dollars? Has anyone taken funding? Please raise by hand, has anyone? Have you, uh, I'm looking for some validation here. <laughs> Let me give you the statistics, the hard straight up statistics. And I'm, I'm, I have many, many dear friends that are indeed venture capitalists. And uh, the more I kind of push to them, the more they like me, and so I actually feel comfortable saying this. Uh, out of a thousand business plans that are created, how many of them do you think are funded? Any ideas? It's about one in a thousand, approximately one in a thousand. Of those that are uh, funded, how many of them do you think are successful, that are very heavily funded? Any ideas? About one in 10. So we're about one in 10,000 now, as far as success models go. go. So I'm really a firm believer that I, under my model, if you take it, you guardrail it, you put resources, you dedicate a certain amount to it, you run hard at it, whether it's $5 or $10 or $50 or $500 or $5,000. It really doesn't matter, but whatever you're comfortable losing, then put towards it, guardrail it, and then run like crazy. And if you fail, that's okay, great, start over again. But in a model where oftentimes you'll spend two or three or four or five years of your life, that's the most valuable part of capital that you have in your life. So I, I guess the first statement I'd make to you is, is if you've got a business idea, don't be afraid to go for it, but if you're going to do it, then run at it hard, plan on success, but if you fail, then fail very efficiently. Uh, let's see, what am I going to talk about next? I think the next thing I want to talk about is navigators. Um, in life, there's four people that you're going to meet over and over and over in life. These people show up in different... Uh, sizes, different looks, different ways, but these four people happen over and over. The first one is the drifter. These are people who just kind of float along in life. Uh, when you see them, they're always saying, yeah, whatever, I'm just here, man, I'm floating with it, I'm working for the man. And uh, they never quite get ahead, but they don't sink all the way. And uh, those individuals are drifters. The next group is drowners. And I think we all have some people in our life that fall into this category. These are the poor individuals that no matter how hard you try helping them up, they'll call you up and say, I'm in crisis, I'm having all these problems in my life. You prop them up, you get them stood up, and then three weeks later you get the call again. I'm drowning, I'm drowning, and you rescue them and pull them up, and uh, three weeks later they drown. And sometimes when I take these people and just want to stick their head under the water and get it over. So those are the... <laughs> Those are the drowners in life. I'll we'll talk a second about why we don't do that. Uh, <laughs> uh, the third group are the surfers. Uh, and I think that oftentimes we confuse the successful individuals with surfers. These are people that oftentimes will chase a lot of money or chase a fancy car or have a big success even in business. But the difficulty is, is they set their objectives and their sights on non-fixed things oftentimes on the ocean. So what they end up doing is, is chasing waves on the water and actually never get to any meaningful, durable, long-term destination. I'd, I'd say, and sometimes it's okay to surf. It's really fun to surf. I, I mentioned that I love the high altitude climb. That's surfing. I don't know if it serves any great grand purpose other than it's fun and it surfs and I'm all for a good surf now and again. But I'd really challenge you as an entrepreneur not to become a surfer because it's really easy to get caught up in that lifestyle. What I would challenge you to become is, is a navigator. A navigator, the main difference is, is they set their objective on a fixed object. The only fixed object in the northern hemisphere is indeed the North Star. It's the only unmovable object to actually look at. Uh, even when you put it at land, you can float your boat around and get all uh, disoriented. And uh, the difference between navigators and surfers is, is not afraid to fight the winds, not afraid to fight through hard things, to cut up tide and to actually go and do something of meaning and, and, and gravity. 
And I'm hoping if there's anything that we're uh, learning here at BYU is, is to have spiritual objective, do things for noble good cause, and to become a navigator. So just real quickly also, I wanted to comment, what do we do with these darn, uh, with these darn uh, drowners that happen in our life? The reality is, is each one of us at one point or another in our life are going to go through a drowning episode. The average person goes through three. Three to four, uh, and as a navigator and an entrepreneur, odds are at some point you're going to hit a brick wall, whether it's financial, hopefully not, hopefully you're smart and follow lean startup or zigzag principles and you're smart enough that you don't get yourself in hot water. But uh, I personally, I've been through three drowning experiences in my life, a spiritual crisis, a physical crisis, an emotional crisis. And um, we need to make sure that when we see people around us that are drowning, that we reach down and pick them up. I love Matthew 15, where the Savior talks about, uh, well, he tells the story three times. The first story is, is the coins that are lost in the couch and how when we rescue the coin, we celebrate. And then he talks, let's see, what's his next one? He talks about the lost sheep. And, and how the sheep, when one, uh, you leave the 99 and go find the one, and then he caps it off by telling the third story of the prodigal son, how when the prodigal son is brought home, a ring is placed on his finger, a cloak, and we celebrate his return. And so as hard as it is oftentimes, now we don't enable drowners, but it's really important that we indeed rescue and help out those around us. And I think that's another major philosophy difference of a surfer versus a navigator. All right, that's the end of uh, my philosophical uh, ramblings. Um, what I'd like to do next is, is maybe just share a couple of the models that I've been using uh, aggressively the last, uh, the last uh, year or so that are kind of fun and get your reaction to them. Um, one of the things that I'm known for is, is quick little tools that really quickly can decide. I mean, so many people say, how'd you come up with all those great ideas? And my comment was, is, oh, ideas are really, really easy. Us as a group, in about 10 minutes, we could come up with a, about 1,000 of them. The question is, is it a stupid idea <laughs> or a good idea? And so I have a number of tools that we, uh, that we use to vet out, the, vet out the principles and the concepts that we come up with and determine uh, how effective they are. I use a dummy down, and I'm sure you've all learned and been taught the Porter model. I love a little modified Porter model. There's a value matrix we use. And I've started using another one this year that just really, really quick, 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 quick snap. You can say, is my idea a potentially good idea that could get me to profitability? Am I getting echo or is it just? I feel like I'm talking into my own head. That's not actually uncommon, but. <laughs> All right, that's better. Okay, so I call this the where do you fish model. I first heard a derivation of this. Uh, it was actually towards book publishing to attribute uh, a, an individual named Ray Bard, a brilliant, brilliant man, the father of the uh, publishing industry. And uh, I've taken it modified a little bit and put it to, to where do you fish in uh, entrepreneurship. So the first uh, uh, matrix is, is, what's the size of the market? Can everyone kind of see that? I know you can't read it because my handwriting is terrible. But can everyone see the quadrants? Okay. How large is the market? One to 10. Then on the bottom is, is what's the felt need? One to 10. Can everyone see that okay? Okay, so the first quadrant, small market, small felt need. I call that a puddle. Let's use an example of that. Let's come up with, let's come up with quote of the day. Let's, let's come up with a business. We got a great business idea. We're gonna do quote of the day for all BYU student males that are in the counting program. Does that excite you? Is that a strong, how, well, first of all, how big's that market? It's really small, right? Even, even a quote of the day for all accountants. That's a pretty small market. How strong's the felt need on that? I need some eyeballs. I need people to, how, how strong's the felt need? You guys with me? Low, low, stupid, right? 
That's really, that, that, that's not strong polynesia. So you never catch a fish in a mud puddle. Would you take your hook and your worm and go and put it in a mud puddle and expect to catch a fish? Heavens no, that's stupid. So why do we create all these businesses that are in mud puddles? I mean, look around, start looking around you of, of all the business ideas that it's some little niche thing that just doesn't fit. Okay, the next one is this really, really large market, uh, but also really low felt need. Let's take that same concept and let's do a quote of the day for all females. We're going to come up with a quote of the day book and we're going to sell it for $15 for every day for uh, the females to have a happy inspirational day. Is the felt need big? Is the market big on that? It is, isn't it? But the, the felt need on that, uh, any females out there? How strong is your felt need on that? Would you pay 15 bucks for that? No, absolutely you wouldn't. So what's the result? You go to the dollar store, you wait six months, and you end up buying five of them for a dollar. So that's called the swamp. You can catch fish in the swamp, but it's carp, and it's catfish, and they taste terrible, and you don't make any money. So don't fish in swamps. Okay, so then the next thing, and this is the biggest mistake that was made, is, is to fish in the ocean. Super strong felt need, super big market. Let's do weight loss. Let's come up with a new magical weight loss pill that uh, you're guaranteed to lose to 10 pounds in a month. Strong felt need, big market. Is that a great place to fish? Actually, I contend, unless you're a large, large company with a huge marketing budget, it's not a great place to fish. Just like the ocean, most of, uh, I remember I was so excited when I went ocean fishing the first time, and all I did all day long was get seasick and <laughs> the troll around the ocean. We never did catch anything the whole day. It was terrible because most of the time the ocean is nothing but dead water. And so unless you have the financial fortitude to really attract the fish, I would actually propose that you don't fish in the ocean when you're first started also. This is where mainstream America plays, and that's the lake. They fish in the lake, kind of right in the middle. And that model is kind of not real strong felt need, kind of middle-sized market. You can kind of make a living, but you never get all the way there. Where I like to fish, personally, and when I'm looking to build a business, one of the criteria that I really seriously look at is can I get a very segmented, niche, tight, little controlled market with a really, really strong felt need? And I call that fishing in the fish hatchery. I like to fish in a barrel, in a fish hatchery where I know there's a ton of fish and I can identify them and get to them really easily and really simply and it's really straightforward. Uh, a good example that I'd heard uh, uh, the last time I'd lectured on this, someone had brought up, I'd used the example of, I guess, uh, equestrians, equestrians, fancy horse riders. There's about 23,500 of them in the United States and they spend money on those horses like no tomorrow. There's a list that you can get to those equestrians, and just by coming out with a simple product that actually improves a little bit, there's a strong felt need towards those horses. So that's an example of a tightly controlled market with a really strong felt need. So anytime you now, someone pitches a business idea to you, just look at it in that model and really quickly, well, what I think you'll find is you'll instantly eliminate about three quarters of the business ideas that are probably not the best place to start particularly if you're bootstrapping. What feedback do I have? What do you guys think? Do you buy it? I got a question back here. So my personal belief, great question by the way, Thank you for being the first to have courage to raise your hand and come up here and I'm going to give you this $100 bill. Right. There you go. Thank you for having the courage to do it. That was the proper way to do it. Now I'm going to answer your question. Uh, and I'm, I'm, How long do I got? Boy, I'm really burning up my time. 
I got 15, 20 minutes. Okay, I'm gonna go really, really fast. So here's my belief, is you fund appropriate to what you can do. So what size of market do you go after? I'm gonna slip into zigzag principle here real quickly. I had a, I, well I didn't have, I still have, but at the point he was seven years old. And in our family we sit around and over dinner, we don't talk about sports, we come up with business models. And we're a bunch of geeks and a bunch of nerds and my whole family loves it. But uh, my little seven year old son, I came home one day and he says, Dad, I got a new business idea. He says, what's that? And he says, well, and he knows his eggs, I got five dollars. And with the five dollars I went down to the store and I made signs and I started a dog poop picking up business. Really? Well, tell me about that, son. <laughs> um, and what he did is, is he ended up taking his five dollars, going building signs, went around the neighborhood, put his, uh, his uh, gloves on, went around and picked all the dog poop up and left a sign on the door that says, this first service was brought to you by uh, uh, Alexander's dog pooping up scooper business. And uh, if you'd like me to do this every month, then I'll charge you $15 a month and I'll come by once a week and off we go. So what was his size of the market based on $5? It was our neighborhood. It was our neighbors. It was maybe 50 to 100 individuals. So that was how he guardrailed at it. This is what his zig looked like. It was $5. Then he goes a little more. That's his zigzag. Okay, if I have $500, it's more like this to start with. What's a 5,000? I like to do them with 5,000. I don't do them anymore, it's too hard. <laughs> I'm just too tired, it's hard, it's hard. Because I have to go like that and like that. What's a 50,000? Well, it's more like this. My angle of inclination increases. But here's the reality of it. The smaller the zig, the quicker the failure, the quicker the failure, the quicker you're on. So what's the size of the market? It totally depends on, on the, the capital that you have to put into it. Now that capital is not only financial capital, it's also intellectual capital. And I'm not following any script, I'm, I totally bagged every slide that I've had here, but I'll try going fast because this is what I feel like I need to talk about. Here's what the formula is, here's what the success formula is. This is from Garrett B. Gunderson, uh, author of Killing Sacred Cows. Intellectual capital, plus intellectual capital plus relationship capital equals financial capital. This is how you have success as young men and young women. You get smart. If you're not smart, don't try. I mean, not, you, you can't fake through being dumb as a box of rocks. And so, first of all, get smart. Invest in intellectual capital, then plus, serve individuals, and primarily, those of influence. Serve your relationship capital. If you do that in the form of a business equal sign, that's what the business is, the equal sign, it yields financial capital. If you reverse that formula, and so many people think, oh, I'm going to take a bunch of money. Think how lunacy this is. I'm going to take a whole bunch of money. I'm going to use a minus sign and take advantage and abuse all of my relationships. And it's going to equal more money. The formula is, is intellectual capital. Use your smarts plus serve the powerful people in your life. Do it in the form of business and you'll make more money. It's really that simple. So uh, oftentimes, small service-based businesses are actually the easiest one to get off the ground. So uh, there you go. Did that kind of answer your question by way of Beirut? Okay. All right, I'm going to quickly pop a slide or two here, if I could. All right, I think I'm going to take maybe just five minutes. I'm going to go through this next slide, and then I'll hold off on the others. Uh, and then I'll open it up for just a few questions here at the end. One of the things that just absolutely uh, kicks me in the pants is, is how frequently I hear everyone say, oh, there's just no opportunities, and oh, the housing industry is coming up, or oh, the housing industry just, uh, just crashed. And I just really wanted to uh, take a few moments and just point out a couple of very interesting tins for you to consider. I'm a big ag advocate of waves, of jumping on a wave. Most of the businesses that I've had real good successes, I wasn't even the best at. But what I learned is, and saw was this wave that was occurring. And uh, I think that not only Newton's third law, for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction, applies in physics, but it also applies to business. An example that I like to use on 911, that was a terrible time to be starting an airline company, right? But it was a brilliant time to be starting a security online company. Wave, anytime I push, 
if I understand that law correctly, and I think I do because I used to be an engineer, if I push, there's equal force going on there. You can't see it, but there's equal force. So nine-tenths of the trick, you guys, is just learning where the waves is. And don't follow it. Look and see what's going on around you. Can I give you a couple of just little examples that I popped on this last six months? Would you guys like to see a couple of uh, business ideas and concepts that I'm seriously looking at? Okay, here goes some waves. First off, this is the, Chinese, uh, the China tsunami. 1.35 billion people live in China. Only 319,000 or million people live in the U.S. The same size in uh, territory, approximately 9 million uh, kilometers. They're now going through their industrial revolution. China has 2.38 millionaires. That's now second in the world only to the United States, guys. It's not Europe, it's not Germany, it's not anyone even close. It's China and growing very rapidly. They're transitioning from a production economy into a consumption economy. I was over there twice this last year and it is nuts. Um, I was going through uh, a little outskirt city in, or near, uh, where was that, was that Beijing or, I don't remember, it was one of the big cities. And there was this line all the way around the block, racked twice, and it says, what the heck is that? Is that the food line? It says, oh, no, no, that's where they buy those little handbags, those $1,000 handbags. The, I mean, literally, a line around the block to be able to buy these, you know, high-end luxury good handbags. Uh, merging middle class is where the big opportunity is. Er, uh, many people are ch chasing really aggressively. Uh, the, the wealthy, 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 but this emerging middle class is now also becoming consumptive. Tier three and four cities, they will, they're throwing those up, like five million people in a city, they're throwing those up in the desert, kind of like we're eating popcorn, okay? Uh, dollars flowing into real estate, uh, you're gonna wanna watch that in the next little bit because they want places to put their money, guess what? That's flowing actually into the U.S. in the form of real estate. Uh, Chinese just got through, end up purchasing, uh, I think it was Bahamas, much of the Bahamas just got purchased. So you're gonna see some really interesting things there. Uh, if I was a young single guy, um, or a young married guy, I'd probably find myself in Hong Kong right now. I think it's that big of a tsunami that's gonna be hitting. And I think that's what I just said. I'd be living in Hong Kong. So there's just a little idea for you. Wanna hit another one? Let's throw, it, let's throw another one up. And guys, here's the deal. All you have to do, I mean, everyone says, oh, you hit a couple here. Guess what? There's 777 of these, guys. This is not hard to do. You just got to take off the blinders and look around you for what's the transactions going on. But these just are a couple of real interesting ones you guys should be aware of. Uh, I get a chuckle every time I kind of involved in judging the business plan competitions. I mean, I'm not, I don't mean to be offensive, but uh, who is the last person in the world that I want to be selling apps to or uh, to be selling to? Who, who is the worst demographic in the entire world? Huh? No. It would be you. <laughs> First of all, you're all poor starving students. <laughs> and second of all, you're uh, all cheap Mormons like me, for the most part. And so... <laughs> Building something where people will actually pay and actually have resources is really a good idea. Let's take a look at the, at the baby boomers and what's going on right there. 77 million in the USA in 2012. For the next 20 years, an average of 10,000 people each day will reach age 65. Adults over 50 now spend 80% of luxury travel spending in America at over $150 billion a year. Sounds like a good number to me. $150 billion a year, that's not a bad number. And that's travel alone. 50 plus are the largest online spedders, 30% of online. Uh, those of you building apps, how many of you are building, I mean, don't raise your hands because I don't want you to feel silly here. How many of you are building it for your fellow students versus how many are you building apps or applications for 50 plus? Okay. Go back to my little model of fishing in a well, or fishing in a fish hatchery, or fishing in a lake, and ask yourself, where am I fishing? I personally like to fish where there's money, where I know that there's fish. Yes? So, I've, I've actually heard about this before, I haven't seen the central, so it's really cool. But <laughs> I've only heard about this because I um, listen to some info from, from various economists. How, how do you come across that information of these waves? Like, did you say there's yeah. so many, but I just... 
open your mind, look around, look and see what's going on, listen to what's going on, get to the nuances of, of just look, look around you, look and see what's going on, not in your own community. Go when you visit grandma and grandpa, look what's happening. I mean, I, I know this first town. My father and mother, or my father and my, my mother died of cancer about 18 years ago, but my stepmom and my dad have been living in care facilities. There's, there's crazy waiting lists. They have to fight to get into anything that's even worth any substance at all. So just look and see where the needs are, not only in your personal selfish little uh, microscopic light, but what's going on in the big universe around you. That's, how you. that's how you put those filters on. Let me finish it and then I'll come back and if you want to hit a little bit more. But I guess what I'm partially trying to say and what I'm trying to model is look around you, open up and look for the fish hatcheries because they are, they're all around you. You just have to get the filters on to start looking for them. I mean, these are just two that I pulled out of the air this afternoon. Where did I get the data? I kind of saw these trends because of my personal life, what I was doing, and I just went and pulled the statistics today. So that's where I got the data from in about a half hour. <laughs> it's called Google. <laughs> uh, two thirds of all seniors 65 and over, and 60% of those uh, 50 to 64 have at least one chronic disease. Ooh, that sounds like medical opportunity there, right? Number of nursing homes dropped almost 9% from 2000. So there's a scarcity in care. 55% of all cancers are diagnosed in individuals 65 and over by 2030. 7.7 million of those are 65 and older will suffer from Alzheimer's. Okay, there's another little trigger for you if you didn't get it of an opportunity, Alzheimer's. And I'm not saying you all turn into healthcare professionals. 50% uh, more today according to the Alzheimer's Association and okay. Uh, 65 group has the highest percentage of people voting at the 72% in the 2002 election. Hmm. There's another interesting business idea. If you looked in there, there's probably about seven business ideas in there, isn't there? <laughs> and all better than building free pizza apps for college students. <laughs> I hope that wasn't too brutal to say. <laughs> okay, ah, uh, you know what? I think I'm gonna skip this one because we only got five minutes later. So your choice, Coquid, you want me to cover brandable chunks, messaging and marketing, how to communicate your message and win all your business pitch competitions, or you want to ask questions for the last five minutes? Well, we're going to do the Q&A Q upstairs. So okay. You can take a few questions now if you'd like, and then we'll break and go through the Q&A. So. Okay, super. Um, one of the most powerful uh, tools that I've been using the last couple of years is called brandable chunks. A very potent way for you to quickly and efficiently uh, communicate your message. Uh, I actually learned this from Roy H. Williams, the w wizard of ads. He's the guy that writes the most successful uh, radio campaigns in the world and typically he'll pick one presidential campaign and do all their messaging. So this guy is really amazingly good. This is his rules verbatim. You take the biggest idea in the fewest words. Brandable Chunk is to be colorful and memorable. It's about the viewer, the listener, the audience, simplicity, clarity, and brevity. It has to be relevant and credible. If it's not one of those, don't do it. Verbs are good, nouns are good, modifiers are not good. Remove block words that do not support the mental image. All that your elevator pitch then becomes is using those brandable chunks back to back to back and it becomes the signature of the brand. It's not a tag or a, a tagline or a slogan. I'm just going to quickly show you one fun little project of one of the little groups that I'm involved with right now and some of their brandable chunks. Kids your age, by the way. And the trick here is just to use these same words over and over and over and over and over and get everyone involved using them over and over. And by that, you build a critical mass. So frequently as I hear these business, and I've judged them all over the world, these business pitch competitions or marketing campaign, whatever, and so frequently, every time you stand up, you're creating a new set of words. Much, much easier way if you use the marketing messages, the elevator pitch, or using all these little brandable chucks. So I just real quickly, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you this business idea and then I'm gonna give you their brandable chunks as an example, and then I think we'll be out of time. I need a young woman to please do this for me. Could, would you volunteer come up and open this for me? Thank you. What's your name? Lauren. Lauren, thank you. Would you just open these for me? Stand up in front of everyone and open those. Okay, there you go. 
I didn't get any oohs or ahs. I felt terrible. <laughs> I always pick a, a young woman because typically they're pretty odd. So this is, this is a, a little business that we've uh, funded and back called Cards to Life that's been getting quite a bit of attention. And let me just quickly now seeing those, read you the brand. Oh, thank you very much. Here, why would you take two of them. Take your pick of two. Thank you, Lauren. So I'm just going to read a couple of these brandable chucks. And then I'll blend them. Watch, watch how cool. I'm not going to do them in order. I'm just going to blend them. And someone asked me about Cards to Life, and I say, living structures in 3D, locally designed, laser cut, amazing real life detail. The card is the gift. That's a brandable chunk. See how easy it was to communicate my message with that? OK, let's do uh, one more round. The best card that you'll ever get, Cards They'll Treasure, handcrafted cards that come to life. You guys buying it? <laughs> you see how easy it is to now take and communicate that? And then I can do my elevator pitch. Cards to life, uh, brandable chunks. Here we go. Give the best card of the party. Cards they'll keep. You, can't, uh, you, you just can't throw them away. Don't buy a card. Give an experience. The card is the gift. Unfold a memory. Living structures in 3D. See, so I have all my messaging already in a bottle that I can just reassemble. Give it a thousand different ways, but then keep very consistent on my message. Uh, this coupled with uh, where do you fish are the two major models that I've kind of been utilizing this year that have been incredibly powerful. I really encourage you if you're worried about branding or if you're trying to uh, win a business competition or you're trying to build a product, this concept of how you communicate it very powerfully and potently by biggest idea in the fewest words, colorful, memorable, and rememberable about the viewer, the audience, the listener, not about you. Simplicity and brevity, relevance and credibility, verbs good, nouns good, modifiers not good, remove black words that support the middle image, and uh, it becomes the signature of your brand. Uh, this, my experience is, is this, and I hate to say this because I was an engineer, some of my greatest best ideas have failed. What it really boils down to for success is three things. First of all, it's not the product. It really is not the product. And I know you all hate to hear that. Number one, it's the channel. If you can get the channel and control the channel and have access into a channel, that's your number one predictor of success. Number two is, is effectively communicating what the product is. Because if it's a great product and you can't effectively communicate it, you're also wasted. Uh, that's number two. And then number three comes the value proposition and value of the product. So flip it on the head a little bit. And I think I'm out of time. So uh, thank you for letting me be with you today and wish you guys great success.